It says it says scheduled up in the upper left. Oh, there we go live. Hey, welcome everyone to this evening's program. Um, as you join us, please type in your name in the chat, where you're from, and what particularly interests you about this presentation tonight. Uh, if you have any reactions throughout the course of the evening, add those to chat. If you just want to say hi to Derek, add that to chat. We like chat. Speakers love feedback. Um, I'm your host, Phil Huff, Executive Director of the Friends of Scotchman Peaks Wilderness. And it gives me great pleasure to host this evening's program as we bring you Derek Lugo, who will be talking about through hiking the Appalachian Trail as chronicled in his book, The Unlikely Through Hiker. Looks like this. This evening's presentation is co-sponsored by the Friends of Scotchman Peaks Wilderness, the Lands Council, Washington Trails Association, Idaho Trails Association, and Idaho Conservation League's Emerging Leaders Program. After the talk, Haley Robinson from ICL's ELLI program will be moderating a question and answer series. So throughout the course of the presentation, please type in your questions as you think about them. Haley's going to collect all of those and put them together at the end in some sense of order. As a long distance hiker myself, I love talking to others about their trail experience. I love sharing mine, I love hearing their stories, and the stories that I've heard from Derek personally, the presentations that I've seen, and his book just bring an absolute delight. They've captured the essence of hiking the Appalachian Trail, in my opinion, the kinds of things that all hikers share, and they also present a very personal story. His AT story is unique to him. This book and his talk tonight are a glimpse into his own life, his unique personal vulnerabilities, and his joys. It's this combination that makes tonight's talk such a compelling one that I think you'll really enjoy, and I think you'll have a lot of questions. A little bit about Derek before we start. Derek had never hiked or camped a day in his entire life. Brooklyn-born, New York-raised, a city urbanite, he hopped a train, went to Georgia, grabbed a taxi at the station, and told the cab driver, drop me off at the Appalachian Trail. And then he did, as he's always done, he put one foot in front of the other and never looked back. Tonight, Derek is going to share the rest of his story. Derek? Hey, thanks for having me, guys. So, like Phil said, I am the author of The Unlikely Through Hiker. Uh, let me open this up for you guys so you can see. Let's see. Okay, trying to share the screen for you guys here so you can see the presentation. There we go. Okay. All right. We're almost there, folks. Almost there. <laughs> Live. You got to love it. Okay, here we go. There we go. So, like Phil said, I am the author of The Unlikely Through Hiker. Um, and what made it unlikely uh, is what I want to share with you guys. So, to start off, I am from New York City. I have never pitched a tent, never hiked, never camped, never done any outdoor stuff. The city was all I knew. Uh, this was my wilderness. These were my markings, how I got around. This is the ride I got to go everywhere I needed to go in the city. And this, that's the wild in New York City. And that's all I knew. City life, nothing about the wilderness. You may be thinking, so how did you find out about the Appalachian Trail? Well, I'm also a big reader. And a friend of mine handed me this book. And she said, it's hilarious. She said, read it. It's a funny read. You're going to dig it. I said, cool. I, I like funny reads. So I grabbed it, read it. And yes, it was hilarious. But the one thing that stuck out was this trail, the Appalachian Trail, that not many people get to accomplish. A lot of people start it, but not a lot of people finish it. So I read the book, loved it, and that stuck in the back of my mind where 
it was like a pipe dream where I wanted to hike the AT, kind of like wanting to travel the world or run a marathon, you know, hike the Appalachian Trail. It was something that was in the back of my mind. Was I wasn't sure if I was going to do it. And the only thing I knew about the AT was that it was a trail that went from Georgia to Maine. That's all I knew. I didn't know if I liked hiking. I didn't know any of that. All I knew that it was a challenge for me to do and that I was going to do it. So I decided I had the time. I didn't have any other responsibilities. So I decided I was going to do it, started to share with people, with my family and friends that I was going to do this trail. And the reaction I got from them was, was this. Now, this is Nina. She is one of the first people I told about hiking the Appalachian Trail. And I'm going to actually read a little section of my book, The Unlikely Through Hiker, uh, her reaction of me uh, telling her that I'm going to hike the Appalachian Trail. And this is her response. Okay, why would you do that? Why would you want to do that? She says, frowning. What? Because I can't. Because I've never done anything like this before, I say. Is she messing with me? It's an, it's an adventure, something I've wanted to do for a while. He never mentioned it before, she shoots back, as if catching me in a lie. I'm sure I did. Look, it's not the point. I'm hiked. What are you, what are you going to eat? Will you have cell service so you can order food? Do they deliver out there? She barrages me with questions, ignoring my efforts to explain. I will bring cell for when I'm in town resupplying and if there's an emergency. I'll be on top of mountains, which I think will be outside of delivery and maybe cell service. I say, not truthfully knowing the answer. Hmm, I don't know about this. How long will it take you? She asks, unable to grasp the, the thought of me doing something so out of character. I'm going to try to do it in five months, I say proudly. You're going to live in the mountains for five months, she repeats, squinting her eyes at me as if I were too far away for her to see. Before I can answer, she continues, listen, pretty boy, I know you. You are the most well-groomed metrosexual black man in New York City. You in the woods without your merit, your beauty products, or your designer clothes. Please, how will you shower? Wait, I don't have beauty products. Okay, maybe lotions. What about manicures? Hmm, okay. I get manicures once in a while. What about, okay, okay, I get it. I say, wanting to finally get my point across before she convinces me I'm too meticulous about my appearance to live out in the woods. So that was one, ex one experience I got, one reaction I got from a friend. Uh, so, my friends thought I was too city-fied. My family thought I was crazed for wanting to do this. And my brother, well, he was like, dude, you should get a machete, man. Take a machete with you, because you never know what's out there. There might be like rednecks or like, you know, creatures out there. Take a machete with you. They come in small sizes. You can strap it to your chest and you go. And I'm like, dude, I'm not, I'm not gonna go out there with a machete. There's, there's no way. There's a big difference between a hiker in the woods, and a dude with a machete in the woods. Worse yet, a dude with dreadlocks in the woods. There's no, there's no way I was gonna do it. So my family was acting crazy. My brother was nuts about the whole machete thing. My mom, she was like, I come from a Spanish uh, family as well. And my mom would yell at me. She would say, mira, ¿por qué tú quieres ser esto? ¿Qué tú eres loco? ¿Qué te pasa contigo? She's like yelling at me in Spanish as she's serving me like a big plate of rice and beans. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm just going to do it. So I decided after I got my family's blessings, I decided I was going to go buy my gear. I'm like, okay. I decided I'm going to through hike within a week and a half. I had gotten all the gear I, I wanted to get and I was off. So I went to an outfitter, walked into the outfitter. First person I saw in there, I was like, hey, I'm going to through hike the Appalachian Trail. Can you help me get some gear? And the lady turns around. She was like, that's great, but I don't, I don't work here. So I'm like, okay, because I was so excited. I just went to the first person. Found the person I worked there. I said, hey, 
I went, I'm going to through hike the Appalachian Trail. Uh, could you help me get my gear? And he goes, okay, cool. I'm down with that. He was a former through hiker and he knew exactly what I needed. And he said, all right, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, backpack do you normally use when you, when you through hike or when you hike? And I go, I don't know. I, I've, I've never hiked before. And he's like, you're going to through hike the Appalachian Trail and you've never hiked before. I'm like, yeah, why not? People do it, right? And I was like, all right. So he helped me get my gear. I got all my gear. As I'm walking out the store, I can I look back and I see in his eyes, I can almost read his mind. He goes, he's like, dude, you, you're going to kill yourself. You're going to get yourself killed. But I didn't care. I was going to go. Uh, so I decided once I got my stuff, I went within a week and a half. I was on the trail. And this is the approach trail, not officially the beginning of the Appalachian Trail, but it's eight miles into it, get you going. Once I saw this arch, I got nervous. I got this pain in my stomach and it hit me. Everything I have in my backpack, all my gear, didn't know how to use. I have stuff that I need to survive for the next five to six months, but I don't know how to use it. And, but I had no choice because I had nowhere else to go. I decided I'm going to do it. I'm already here. Uh, and I had nowhere else. The plan was to live in the woods. So where am I going to go after this? So I just went ahead and started hiking. Once I got to Springer Mountain, and as I said before, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to pitch my tent. First time I pitched my tent, I think at one point I tried to pitch it in, in, my, uh, in my bedroom. Kind of got some of it up. But uh, didn't know. This isn't actually my tent, but it's kind of what it looked like. Um, at one point I was trying to get the stakes in the ground and his hiker saw that I was struggling with it and he grabbed the rock, tapped all the stakes in, looked at me, tossed the rock and walked away. And I'm like, dude, you are a genius. So I grabbed the rock and put it in my backpack cause I was going to use it to help me. No, I didn't do that. But it was one of the lessons where I learned how to pitch my tent. Uh, I also learned how to use my filter for the first time. Also learned how to use my mini stove and how to bear bag. At least they had wires, at least how to use that to hang it up. So that was the first. In fact, the first chapter of the book is called Lessons at Springer Mountain because what I should have learned months ago, I learned on the trail, on my first day on the trail, which I thought, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll learn. Now that I think back about it, now that I think about it, I'm like, dude, that was like the biggest mistake. You should be prepared. That's something that when people ask me my advice about hiking, I'm like, first find out if you like hiking and also go out there and experience it a little bit. Do some weekend hikes. Don't do what I did. But once I, the, the, uh, I did that, next morning I hiked by myself because when I first started the approach show, there's kind of people around me. But I left camp late. I left camp maybe, I think it was like two hours after everyone left because I'm from New York and I get up late. I'm a night, I'm a night owl. So I get up late, go to bed late. I get up late uh, and it took me forever to get my stuff back in my pack because I didn't know exactly where they belonged. So I started hiking, started following this, this white blaze. I'm like, cool. I know about this. I know that I follow this blaze and it will take me all the way from Georgia to Maine. What I got to lose. And the, the rule was that if you're standing next to a white blaze, then you should be able to see the next one, which wasn't actually the truth because it's 2,200 miles of the trail and it's going to be hard to cover, you know, every tree, every so many yards. So there was times where I would kind of get turned around or pause and look because uh, I would get paranoid. Uh, so I was like, you know what? I got this. I see a white blaze. I got this. I can do this. But then I saw a blue blaze. I'm like, okay, what's, what's going on here? Uh, and then I find out, I was told that a, a blue blaze is what takes you from to side trails, to the privy, to other trails. So that was the, the blue blaze that I took to the approach. But once I got back to the white blaze, I'm like, I got this. I'm going to go. So I start hiking. First day by myself, I'm spooked. This is the first time from New York City. Okay, I'm used to like car horns. I'm used to all these different sounds. The wilderness is a different, different thing. So I'm hearing squirrels running on dry leaves. But to me, it sounds like 
like a stampede of wild boars until I actually see squirrels. And then I see like these little figures, like logs and, and, and branches and stuff that look like beasts, like dragons and stuff, freaking me out. So my mind is just going crazy. That first day I was jumping around like crazy. But then eventually within the, within the first week you're there, you're surrounded by so many people that are, that want to finish, that want to actually through hike. And within I think the percentage at the time of me writing my book, it was 25% of the people that start a through hike actually finish it. So you start with a lot of people. And the first, I would say within the fifth day, I started hiking with this group. Now this group I, I named the moving village because you're at camp, you have these tents up and it looks like a village. And then the next day you break it down and you move. So we are like a moving, moving village. And within the first week of our uh, through hike, everyone in this group had a uh, had a trail name, except for me. I didn't have a trail name. They had decided that, hey, let's give Derek a trail name. It's you know, it's it's time. A week, and here's the thing about through hiking or being out there in the wilderness: a week is a long time to be out there. It's like time moves faster when you're through hiking, uh, and a week without a trail name was like, all right, dude, what what are you doing? So we decided at camp that we were going to give give me they were going to give me a trail name. So they wanted to get to know me a little bit. And looking at this photo, I'm surprised that I wasn't called Captain Jack Sparrow. Like, look at this dude. Like, <laughs> I look like I'm, I I could be a pirate. So I shared a little bit about myself. I told them, and I would joke about how like I decided that I was going to through hike but stay fresh and clean because through hikers are known for not taking uh, baths for, or showers for days and sometimes weeks. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to roll like that. I'm going to make sure that I shave. And when I see a stream or at a water source, give myself a bird bath, I would joke around about wishing I had a full length mirror that I can like kind of like throw in the back of my backpack, pull it out and kind of like, you know, keep clean. And at the time, I was definitely more of a metrosexual. After my through hike, I was less, but I wanted to make sure I looked I looked clean. And a through hiker just threw out the name. He was like, "You're a Mister Fabulous. That's who you are." And I said, "No, man, I can't. I can't go around calling myself Mister Fabulous. It's like, you know, how am I going to do that? I'm just going to go up to people. Hi there. I'm I'm Mister Fabulous. There's no way." Um, I'm, I'm a people person and I, I can talk to anyone, but for me to go out and tell people that I'm Mr. Fabulous, it's like, you know, what, what kind of reaction I'm going to get. So in the beginning, he convinced me to use it. He's like, look, dude, hike with it for, you know, a week and see how it feels. First week, people, one of the first, one of the things that you get asked a lot when you through hike is what's your training? And when I would answer them, I would almost apologize to people and say, look, guys, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, they call me Mr. Fabulous, um, but I didn't name myself. But the reaction I was getting wasn't what I expected. It was more of um, people were like just smiling and, and laughing and happy. And it had a, they were like they wanted to know why my name was Mr. Fabulous. So it had... I had a story I can share with them, which I love. I love staring, sharing stories. And uh, it, the reaction wasn't like, hey, who's this dude that thinks he's Mr. Fabulous? So I felt a little more comfortable with it. But the day that I decided I was going to keep my trail name was I was hiking by myself and there was a group of elderly hikers uh, going south. I was going north and uh, they they would ask me questions. They found out I was through hiking, wishing me luck and, and just, you know, talking to me and stuff. And the last person that went by, she was an older woman. She must have been like 200, like older than the Appalachian Trail. She had like this aide helping her. She had a cane. She was really small and cute. She came up to me. She heard that I was a through hiker and she said, what, what's your trail name? And I said, ma'am, uh, my trail name is Mr. Fabulous. And without missing a beat, she goes, Oh my God, I've been waiting for Mr. Fabulous my entire life. And she goes up, grabs my face, gives me a kiss on my cheek, and like storms off, kind of has her cane like twirling and kind of skipping away. Her aide is kind of like chasing after her. And I thought, wow, that's it, it ended up being more of 
the, the story I can share with people, the reaction people were getting. So for me in my head, it, I'm not Mr. Fabulous. It's a story. It's the reaction I'm getting from people. And it was more, it was more of my, my through hike. Uh, so I stuck with Mr. Fabulous. And to this day, when I'm on the trail, I'm telling stories and people call me Mr. Fabulous, it feels, it feels normal. The only time it feels a little bit weird is when I'm not on the trail or I'm not in a hiking community, I'm not telling stories, then it gets a little weird. But um, at, at one point, I try to convince people in New York City to call me Mr. Fabulous, and I'll talk about that later. But um, another lesson, there was a lot of lessons I learned on the trail. And one of the lessons, this hiker, this through hiker, his name is Birdman. And as soon as he saw me, he just started, he was like, mind if I take a picture of you? Uh, and he was just, he saw something in me and he wanted to take a selfie with me and then take a picture by myself. And he shared a story that stuck with me uh, where he met a through hiker that through hiked the year before. And he asked that through hiker, if there was one thing you could change about your through hike, what would it be? And I, the hiker said, well, I brought a camera with me and it took pictures of beautiful sceneries, uh, trees, grass, dirt, everything around me. But the one thing I wish I would have taken more pictures of was people. And he didn't have the Birdman didn't have to finish that. It clicked right away because it's true. You could take a photo of a beautiful, beautiful scenery sunset, sunrise, trees, everything. And yeah, it's beautiful, but the moment you can't, there's, there's a moment there that you can't capture in the photo, how you were feeling. But with this photo, I know exactly the conversation I was having with that person. His name pops up, his look pops up. Actually, <laughs> every time I see him, he looks like, doesn't he look like a lawn mo uh, gnome? Those gnomes that you put in the lawn, doesn't he look like one of those? <laughs> Every time I see him, he makes me smile. And I remember the story that he told me. So I took that and ran with it. And every person, not everyone, but people that I had a connection with on the trail, I would take a photo of. So if someone gave me trail magic, which is someone that gives, uh, um, gives you food or something you need on a trail, a ride into town or a shower or something like that at their home, they're, they're trail angels. And what they give you, the gift they give you is trail magic. And I would take pictures of them. I, that way I would look and I go, okay, I remember the, the connection I have with them. So that was one lesson that uh, he shared with me and I thought well, it, was, it was amazing. Now there's a lot of reasons uh, besides me being uh, from the city that I was an unlikely through hiker. Uh, if you look at this picture, like look at those bandanas. Like, there, actually there's two things I can't, I can't do in New York City. I now live in Asheville, but when I went back to New York City, there's two things I couldn't do. I couldn't go around calling myself Mr. Fabulous. Trust me, I tried, and my friend Nina was like, I ain't, I ain't doing that. And the second thing is looking like this. I miss, I miss looking like this. Unless I was in Times Square juggling, there's no way I can look like this ever again, uh, unless I'm, I'm through hiking. Um, and so there's, like I was saying, there's a lot of reasons why I was in a life through hiker. One was because I'm from the city, had no experience, never camped out, never pitched a tent, all that jazz. And also I stuck out like a sore thumb because I wasn't, and this is something I didn't realize until I actually uh, was through hiking. I didn't know it was an issue where there's not a lot of people of color on the trail. And I didn't believe it when I first heard it. I said, no, there's no way. Like this kind of like I was sad about it because this is an amazing adventure. And although I didn't realize it until I actually started doing it, it changed my life. It, it was something that now I'm living a different life than I did before I threw hiked. And it's different for everyone, but there's def definitely some magic on the trail um, for lack of a better word. There, it's very, it's very magical on the trail. So that, and also being, um, once I found out that there wasn't a lot of black people on the trail, I would want to like scope. Like I would look every time I saw someone on the trail, a day hiker or whatever. And the only black people I saw on the trail were like a day hiker. And it was like his first time out in the woods, you know? And I found out eventually that I was the only black person uh, that through hike that season. I've seen some through hikers throughout the years, but not many still. And people ask me, uh, one of the questions people ask me is why do you think that's the thing? And I can't, I can't answer for the entire black community, 
but I can speak for my experience and the reaction I got from my family and friends and growing up is that one, I didn't know about it. There was the only way I found out was when I was an adult reading a walk in the woods, didn't have a book like this that had this dude that kind of looks like me, you know, and, you know, the, the little Derek didn't have anything. No one was telling him about the AT. The only thing this New Yorker knew was, you know, Central Park or the beach or Yankee Stadium. You know, it wasn't something that you were taught when you were a kid. Uh, two, financially, we couldn't afford something like that. With gear, like families that have been hiking since they were a kid, you get gear sometimes handed down from like family member to family member. When I decided I was going to through hike, it wasn't cheap getting all my gear within a few days. So that's another factor is that, you know, financially we can't really, can't really afford it. And third reason I think is lore. Uh, we think about the woods. I mean, I, I remember the movie Deliverance, you know, bad things happen in the woods. Also, you know, the only black people think of the woods when you're in the woods, it's the underground railroad, you know, like you, you escaping from something. Not good things happen in the South in the woods with black people. So there's those things. Um, and, and this is the reason why I'm out here talking and sharing my story. The reason why I wrote my book was because, hey, there's this wondrous thing out there, this trail, and not just the Appalachian Trail. You got the PCT in the West Coast. You guys know what I'm talking about. And this, the outdoors, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's a healing thing. And, um, it's, it's the reason why I'm sharing my story. So those are the three factors um, that I see. And I've heard other black hikers say the same thing. And it's the reason why I'm out here sharing my story. Now, I don't want to ruin the end for you guys, but I did finish my through hike. Now, this photo, again, it's like I said earlier, one of these photos that I look at and I remember the emotions I had. The last chapter, there's maybe two, three chapters in the book where I, when I write it, when I wrote it, it was, I had to actually put myself into that place where I was at that time. And when I see this photo, I remember all the emotions I had. And I remember all I did was I sat on that, on that old worn out sign and just put my arms up embracing what I just experienced. And my friend Shanti, who I threw hiked, uh, I think it was halfway through my through hike. We ended up hiking together. She took this photo and ended up representing uh, kind of my the emotion I had at that moment. So I like I'm getting towards the end or at the end of my presentation. I like to end it with a quote that I could never memorize. I don't know why I can't ever memorize this, but this is a quote that I found that I I think kind of touches on uh, how I feel about the outdoors, and it goes. If you want to sound wise, go to school. If you want to be wise, go to nature. Thank you guys. One thing I wanna share with you guys is, or a few things is that you can find me in social media at Derek Lugo and also my website. I have a special for you guys. If you wanna buy my book, The Unlikely Through Hiker, you can go to my website, DerekLugo.com uh, and you guys, if you type unlikely 10, you get 10% off and it's a signed copy. So check that out on my website. I'm constantly sharing stories about my through hike, my new adventures, what's coming up next in my social media, more on Instagram, but also I, I, I'm on, on Facebook. Uh, and check out my website for other stories that I don't have in this book, Extra Stories. So check it out. Love you guys. Thank you. I'm muted. You think that <laughs> I thought I was like, I get it, but here I am. <laughs> anyway, I'm Haley. <laughs> I know how to use a computer. Um, I am on the advisory board of the Idaho Trails Association, um, and I run the um, Emerging Leaders for Idaho's Environment program through the Idaho Conservation League. So, Derek, thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, we had a couple of questions come in during your presentation, so I'll throw those to you if you're ready for them. Yes. Um, the first one I saw was, what was your favorite snack when you were on the trail and what was your favorite dinner? Uh, okay, my favorite snack, I'm a, ve I'm a vegan now, but I wasn't when I threw hike. I was a vegetarian. My favorite snack was Snickers. I loved Snickers. It gave me a boost. Um, 
I would say the food that I ate, I pretty much ate from the beginning to the end. So I would have oatmeal and Pop-Tarts for breakfast, which I love. Never got tired of the oatmeal. Pop-Tarts a little bit. Snickers I never got tired of. Um, and then as far as dinner, my favorite was those rice sides. Um, I'm Latino, so I have like, you know, I love the, the Spanish rice one. So I would do that. But also wanted to keep my pack light, although I didn't in the beginning and throughout my hike, I, it was pretty heavy. Uh, I try to get uh, ramens because ramen noodles are pretty, pretty light. So what, without a doubt, it was Snickers and those rice sides were slamming. Awesome. Um, another question we had was, what was your integration like when you went back to the city? Uh, so I had decided I wasn't going to go straight back to the city. Um, halfway through my hike, I, I knew I was going to write about my experience. So I didn't want to go back to the city because there was so many distractions. I, I always say that when I was on the trail, the one thing I was able to do was complete my thoughts. And I couldn't do that on a trail um, on uh, in New York City uh, because there's so many different distractions. I've been there my entire life and I can just get lost in that quickly. Uh, so I decided... I was going to uh, stay, luckily a friend of mine, a hiker friend, his parents had a, a cabin and I was able to stay in the cabin for three months and start writing. So I wanted to start a writing routine in a cabin I had no Wi-Fi, almost like, actually it was in the woods on top of a hill. And I got to relive my through hike. So for another three, three months and beyond for like two years, I relived my, my hike through my writing. So when I went back to New York City, I had a routine and I made sure that I prepared myself to actually stay in that moment. But it's hard getting distracted, get going, trying to go back to, to work. I tried not to have a cell phone for a while and then I, I started bartending and the owner was like, dude, get yourself a cell phone, this is ridiculous. So it's hard to try to keep what you had on the trail. But I, I think after so many years, I can balance the two now. And I'm because of, like I said earlier, my life has changed that I'm constantly doing talks, doing many talks every week uh, and sharing my story that I'm reliving the, the, the trail. If I'm not hiking, I'm talking about it. So I'm not losing any of it. I, I think I lucked out that way because I get to continue sharing it. Uh, it may be different for other people, but I've heard stories of people not being able to sleep in bed. They would have to sleep on the floor. I didn't have a problem with that. I liked the bed. I was just <laughs> that was a problem. I'm happy to have the bed back. Um, did you ever think about quitting? And if so, what made you keep on hiking? Um, one of the things that I I had a lot going against me. I had no experience. So the, one of the things I decided from the jump was keep positive. That's why. Uh, if you read my book, I have a saying that I used to write, peace, love, and all that good stuff in journals and stuff like that, in registers uh, afterwards. Because uh, in registers, you can just write about your daily routine and then leave something at the end. And uh, so that would remind me, that was my mantra. And also that I was going to embrace everything that hit me. So I, I walked into this knowing I was going to hike in, in, in rain. I was going to hike in the cold. And I'm, my peoples are from the tropics. I like hot weather, warm weather. And when we, I hit the Smokies and it was freezing, like I hated it, but I knew, I knew it wasn't going to be like that throughout the entire trail. And this is what I walked into. Um, so I embraced everything and that's the key. There was a hiker in the beginning that talked about the AT like he was, I, I was like, this dude is a spokesman of the AT on my first day. And he was like, this, this, and I'm like, this dude is going to finish the trail and this and that. I saw him in like three days on a rainy day and he was miserable. Within a week, he was off the trail because he didn't embrace it. He didn't like take everything in, not judging the way he did it. And me, yeah, that may have been the way he embraced it, but uh, that's not really embracing it. But that was the one thing that I knew I had to do. Uh, there was one time where I was like, I'm not happy out here. But I was already up in like Vermont or New Hampshire, and I was like, "There's no way I'm not getting off. I'm getting off." The trail. But that was like a split instant. And once I started hiking, I loved it. So no, for the most part, no. That's awesome. Um, you ended up in Asheville, North Carolina. How did that happen? Ah! <laughs> so um, I spent this year. You know, guys, this year is the worst. And when the, when we had to quarantine in the spring, it was. New York just wasn't New York anymore. In the beginning, I was like, oh, man, I got, I got a week off, too. I thought it was only going to last a few weeks. I'm like, I got time to write and this and that. It ended up being longer. 
And I like being around people and it was really hard for me. And New York wasn't New York anymore. And they started warning us that it was going to be worse in the fall. And I've been wanting to, this year was going to be my book tour. And I wasn't even gonna, gonna be able to do that. And hike, I went to hike and just travel with my book. And I had did a, my first talk, my first book tour talk here in Asheville with Jennifer Farr Davis. She gave me a tour of it. Kind of was joking around like, hey, if you ever want to leave New York, this would be a great place for you because it's a hiker town. They would love you. Live music. I worked at a live music venue in New York City. And once I decided I was going to move out of New York, this was one of the first places that popped in my head. And I'm happy now. I'm surrounded by mountains. I'm kind of in a secluded area in like three acres and right near downtown area. Once everything opens up, I'll have the live music again. So it's just a great fit for what I'm trying to do because I want to continue writing and hiking and sharing adventures with people. So this, I think, is the right place for me to be right now. That's awesome. Um, Jesse Grossman asked, did you know that you wanted to write a book um, when you started or did you decide that later on? Not at all. I've been writing since I was a teenager. Um, I've had, you know, I have sh I've written short stories, uh, manuscripts, but nothing you know, poems, but nothing I really wanted to share with people. Halfway through my hike, well, I had, I had a journal with me, so I would write daily to people I met, and this little, I'm a Virgo, and very organized, and my brain works where, okay, I met this person, I'm all, you know, I started at this time, I finished at this, this time, I did this many miles, and this is how many miles I got to go. So, I was doing that, but halfway through my hike, once I realized this was something really special that I was doing, and people were telling me that, hey, I think you're the only through hiker on the trail. I realized that I need to write this. People were saying, look, dude, you're a writer, write your story. So I knew halfway through my hike, I was going to do it, but I made a point not to try to change what I was doing in order to fit the through hike. Uh, luckily, a lot of nice fun, even in the woods for six months, okay? I wanna change my hike um, and make it kind of fun adventure, do challenges and stuff. So I found, a, I'm all over the place with this answer, but I'm gonna answer it this way because I've heard story, uh, I've heard this saying where uh, a good writer can write about something mundane and make it sound interesting. So to me, the little things I was able to like make, because in my head, the way my mind works, it was interesting. And I was, I'm hoping it came out that way uh, in, in the book. So halfway through it, I knew I was going to, I kept a journal, same way I did before, but my first draft of the book, came off the top of my head. And then the details, I went back into my journal and photos, which I told you photos hold a lot of details and information. I went to those as well. But yeah, halfway through my hike. That's great. Um, have you connected with other unlikely hikers who've been influenced or inspired by your story? Um, I, I know a few hikers that uh, hiked, that are unlikely hikers. There's a few that reached out to me. There's one, there's one, one young lady that I met when I was through hiking. She was doing a weekend hike and wasn't sure if she wanted to through hike. And I was on this high that the AT is amazing. Anyone I wanted to talk about it, even afterwards, even now, I was like, it's the most amazing thing. And I told her, look, if you're thinking about doing it, just do it because you don't know when you're ever going to do it again. And she reached out to me a couple of years later and said, I through hike the AT because of you. Uh, and I felt, I forgot her trail name, but her name is Jessie. And I was like, wow, I didn't even think, I was just sharing my story and like so happy about what I was doing. I do get messages from people saying uh, they're inspired now by the book that they want to through hike. Also messages that they didn't realize, they, they're not hikers, they're not outdoors people, but since they follow me on Instagram, they were like, let me read this. And it ended up getting other things out of it. Cause for me, this isn't just about hiking. It's about stepping out of your comfort zone, living your dream, doing something that you've always wanted to do. And I think this story actually, my story shares that. So yeah, I, I got a lot of positive feedback and people are being inspired. I just thought I had a good story to share and hopefully a few people um, would read it. But now I feel that I do have a responsibility uh, to share my story and to hopefully a little do a little Derek sees my book uh, and can actually, you know, hopefully get inspired to do something amazing. Awesome. Um, you talked a little bit about how your friends and family were pretty shocked when you said that you wanted to take on this new adventure. Um, have you taken any of your friends or family out? Have any of them tried hiking since oh, they, your adventure? 
they think they're experts now. You know, <laughs> they're like, oh, the Appalachian Trail, you know, when they introduce me to their friends, Derek, you know, hike the Appalachian Trail. Now that I have a book, like he wrote about the Appalachian Trail. And they started talking about it and this and that. My brother, uh, he said, look, man, after I finished, like, you did it. I guess I could do it too. And I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> so he ended up, without even trying to do the same thing I did, with just buying here and going, his reaction was totally different. We did this adventure. It was actually documented. The ATC did a short film called Trail Brothers. It's on YouTube. And I hiked, I found a trail, which I didn't realize there was a trail in New York City that actually takes you from New York City to uh, the AT, uh, Bear Mountain. So you go over George Washington Bridge, you hike along the um, Long Path Trail along the Hudson River, and it takes you like 50 miles up to the AT. So my brother was like, let's get some gear and let's go. And within that first day, he was huffing and puffing and he was like, oh. and it turns out that he doesn't like hiking. He, he just likes camping. I'm a hiker and I love camping as well, but he'd rather just drive up and camp. But yeah, now my friend Nina, I took her for a couple of hikes, you know, so now they're like, oh, okay, this is cool. So yeah, my mom still doesn't understand it, but uh, <laughs> Yeah, there's a, you know, and that's the thing when you can inspire others to do something that's amazing. I wish I would have found, discovered this a long time ago and, and done this. Like it's, so I'm glad that people see my story, see me and people that know me, they're like, yo, dude, what the, you out there in the woods? Like, and then they're like, oh, you did it. And then they want to hear it. So now, and I'm a storyteller. I love telling, telling stories. So I can talk about the AT for hours. So yeah, they all think they experts now. <laughs> Um, one question was there are, there were, I think in one of the photos, three different colored bandanas around your waist or hanging from your belt loops. Um, are they a fashion statement or do they have any separate functions? So I started off, I think with two bandanas. I had one that I eventually started wrapping around my head and one I would use to just, you know, uh, you know, wipe my face or rinse myself out because, you know, the metrosexual, the Mr. Fabulous had to keep himself clean. Uh, the other ones, one I found, a brand new one at a shelter, and I was like, this is new, and okay, I'm going to take it. And then that ended up being three, and then someone else gave me one, and then it was a purple, and I love purple. I was like, okay. So it ended up being where, like, okay, I want these. And I was like, okay, this looks good. And then after a while, it just – it accidentally became a fashion statement. You know, I was like, okay. And then I tried to do that after a through hike or when I did a weekend hike and it just didn't have that same feeling. Mm -hmm. so, but it ended up being where I just had certain ones for certain things and then it ended up being a fashion statement, yeah. Um, What is your next adventure? Are you gonna do the PCT? Ah, that's the question. Um, for a while, Shanti and I have been playing, playing around with the idea of doing the PCT in 2022, which would be the 10 year anniversary of our through hike. Um, I would say I really want to, my life is totally different now. Um, there's a story in that, uh, if I can, cause I'm going to continue writing. Uh, I always say if someone sponsors me, I'm, I'm there, I'm doing it. My life is totally different. I have a partner now. She's down. She's like, look, man, if you want to go for six months, you, you can go. Uh, so I would say, yeah, it, it looks like I may do that. Um, I'm surrounded by mountains now, so I'm doing a lot of day hikes, uh, weekend hikes. We just got a puppy, so I'm going to do hikes with the puppy. There's a story in here um, called Magic, and it's, it's a story of me finding a puppy on the trail. It's a sad, one of the saddest chapters I've written. To this day, I can't read it without my eyes welling up. Uh, so having a puppy, having a dog to hike with. So yes, there's going to be a lot of adventures, uh, not just hiking adventures, but I want to write about a bunch of new things that I may be uh, doing uh, that is kind of unlikely for me. Uh, but yes, you're gonna, I'm going to continue doing a bunch of stuff, a bunch of adventures. Um, have you heard of the Idaho Centennial Trail? That one could be added to your list, perhaps. <laughs> yes, I, I've heard of it, and yes. <laughs> and it was uh, what was the first piece of gear that you discarded? Ah, that's a good question, actually. So my pack started off with, it was like 42 pounds, my pack. So I had stuff in there. I had like two weeks worth of food where I only need like two or three days worth of food. Uh, the one thing that I had that I used maybe two or three times was an outdoor shower where it was like kind of like a bladder where you fill it up and then you hang it up on a tree and it had a little thing where you, and then you kind of take it in a shower. And I thought that was like the dopest thing because that's how I'm going to stay fresh. 
You know, I used it. Uh, the, I think the first time, first or second time I used it, I was on the side of a mountain and I kept sliding I, and I kept like, I had soap on me and I slip it and like in the book, you'll see like I'm smacking my face on the, <laughs> on the ground and I came out of it. I came out of the shower with leaves stuck to my face. I'm like, this ain't working the way I thought it would work. So that was one of the first things I got rid of was the, the shower gel that Mr. Fabulous thought he could actually make use of. Is really funny. Um, I had a question too, which is, um, as you started in on this new adventure, was there something that you were pretty apprehensive about that came more naturally to you than you were expecting? And then kind of conversely, was there something that you thought was going to be really easy that turned out to be a lot more difficult? Hmm. Uh, let's see. That's actually a good question. I would say, oh man. I would say the hiking itself, I wasn't sure what to expect, ended up being easier than I anticipated because I took my time uh, with it. I think um, once I got used of using my gear, it just came naturally. Uh, at one point we were doing a resupply in a small town and we went to Wally World. Walmart is like a hiker's best friend because everything's cheap. And the person that gave us a ride watched Shanti and I, as we grabbed our stuff and we quickly put it in our pack. So everything became automatic for me. Uh, so I think uh, that being that, that part of it uh, became easier than I anticipated. Uh, what was harder, <clears throat> man, I would say those, I knew it was going to be hard, but those mountain climbs ended up being pretty, pretty tough. I. I walked into this knowing that the mountains was going to be my weakness, but man, it was tough having a pack. I think having the pack and hiking up uh, was harder than I anticipated. Once I figured out how to use my pack, how to wear it, because I was wearing it wrong and it was pulling on my shoulder. Uh, and then once I told myself, because I was psyching myself out, I was saying, hey, man, these mountains, oh, another mountain, you know. And the AT is the same. When in doubt, the AT goes up. You know, like that's... The, a lot of mountains, you're going up and down for months. Once I told myself that I wasn't, that that I can do this and just hike, then it ended up being um, a little bit easier. But yeah, those two things. Um, we had one question that is, you've mentioned Shanti. Can you tell us a little bit more about trail families? Ooh, trail family. So that was one thing that I didn't expect when I threw hike. I thought I was going to hike by myself. I was going to start by myself and finish. That was, it was a challenge for me. I was going to get nothing more. I wasn't going to write a book. I wasn't nothing. Just, I wanted that challenge. That was my mindset. But then right away, uh, you you get connected with hikers. And I always say this, when you meet new people, normally you need like an icebreaker. What's the icebreaker that gets you guys going? The icebreaker was right away that we were through hiking. So we didn't need that icebreaker. We once you meet someone that's through hiking, you, you just start talking to them. First day, your friends, second day, your best friends, and a few days later, your your family. Uh, I ended up hiking with that group, the Moving Village, and we were tight. This group where, and then afterwards, we hiked together for a month, and then afterwards, I hiked with a smaller group. But with this first group, we planned where we were going to go. So we would say, okay, we're going to do 10, 15 miles today, 20 miles. And we knew exactly where we were going to end up. Uh, sometimes we didn't hike together, but we had that group and we felt that connection, that safety, which I, I felt more comfortable. I always say that I love hiking by myself. I mean, I can hike with people or, you know, by myself, but camping, I need people around me because still the New Yorker in me is like, what the, what, what is that? You know? Um, and then the second group, was more loosey goosey where like, they were like, okay, you know, we'll see each other along the trail and we would kind of meet each other, but it was a few weeks of like being with them and not being with them, but they were still part of this little group. So it was two different types. And then in between, I was by myself. Uh, and now to this day, these are people that are my friends forever. And even not just through hikers, but hike people that I meet during doing my book tour, people that have read my book, if you're a hiker, that's the connection we have. This hiking community is just a beautiful thing. And I adore it. It was one of the things that I did not expect when I finished my through hike. There's this connection, trail angels, makes you want to be a trail angel when you finish through hiking. It's 
it's just a beautiful thing. If you've been part of a hiking community, you know what I'm talking about. And it was one thing that never, and also having them embrace me the way they did, where one, I didn't know what I was doing and they didn't judge me. There's no judgment on a trail. No one's judging you the way you look or whatever. People that I would probably never hang out when I was off the trail, although I love everyone, was hanging out. We were tight like dreadlocks, you know? So it was, it was a beautiful thing. Uh, them helping me out, uh, you know, it was just, yeah, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Awesome. Um, what was your favorite piece of gear? My favorite piece of gear, I would say what really saved me, and I say this all the time, was my trekking poles. I almost left New York City without buying trekking poles. And then as soon as I left my apartment, I walked out, didn't, didn't realize how heavy it was, and I fell to the side and my face hit the wall and I had, I was like this and I had my trekking poles here and I said, Oh man, I'm so glad I had these. And I took it all the way from Georgia. I actually put them in my backpack because they went with me everywhere I went. They saved me a lot of times. So I would say my trekking poles, without a doubt, I could have never finished my through hike without the trekking poles. It's amazing what a difference they make. Cause the first yep. time I used them, I was like, what are these going to do with these little sticks? And then I was like, oh, wow. huge difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what is your next writing project or what would you like to write about next? Oh, I got a few projects. Uh, I actually, Audible just, uh, they're going to license my The Unlikely Through Hiker and want me to narrate it. So I had to go through like an audition phase where they were like, okay, you wrote the book, but we want to know if you can actually read. I'm like, I can do this. So I sent them like uh, a chapter or two of me narrating the book, and now I'm going to narrate that. So we're, we're in the process of working on a pro, um, uh, contract and doing that. So that's my next immediate project. I'm working on um, on and off on a children's book version of The Unlikely Through Hiker. Although this is kid friendly, has no curses, it has made up curses like Son of a Brooklyn Bridge or something like that. But you can read this to your kids. But I also want to write a children's book version of this where it's a kid little black kid from Harlem and uh, he finds out his dad has the book in the library or something like that. And he's like, Hey, what's this? And then it goes from there. So I don't want to give away the whole plot, but uh, that, and um, also I've been reading other hiking books and stuff and I'm itching to write another adventure book. So I'm thinking of doing some, it's, it's tough with what's going on right now. Cause all my plans are kind of changing. So um, I'm thinking of, I have a few ideas for different uh, adventures to write about. Cause I want, that's what I am. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a travel writer now. I'm doing all these crazy fun things. Uh, so people can actually, you know, uh, see and, 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 you know, like you step out of their comfort zone and like, Hey, I could, I could probably do that. This dude is doing it. Why not? You know? So I just want to share stories and hopefully inspire people at that. Like I said, in the beginning, when I first wrote this book, that wasn't really in my that, that wasn't what I was thinking about. I was thinking about just sharing a great story and sharing about the AT. Uh, but now I, I do feel like I have a responsibility to, to share more adventures uh, with people. Kind of on that note, um, did you ever come across anyone on the trail who was not supportive or didn't embrace you or made you feel different? Uh, I, I want to say everyone, I felt different. And, and I, I, I felt different even before the, I did the AT. Um, I would say everyone, everyone I encountered, nothing but positive. There was one small moment where um, I got off the trail to, and it's not a big deal, but it's the only thing I can think of. And it was a museum right off the trail. It was like a school that was like a cabin and I wanted to check it out. And as I was crossing the, the dirt road, there was these uh, guys on horseback. There's like maybe four of them. And they went, whoa, hiker. And I went by and they were like, hey, you know, they looked at me like they'd never seen a black dude before. And this is deep in the South. And the first thing that came out of his mouth, he was like, hey, where are you from, Africa? You know, because I had my hair up and like some, it looked like an African like bun or whatever. And not that it looked like, it, it was just a dude with dreadlocks. And he said, where are you from, Africa? And I was like, mm, no, I'm from that other black place, Brooklyn, you know, some joke like that. And then he just, he was just looking at me and kind of like observing me, like kind of like, he's like, I've never seen anyone like you out here. So yeah, you know, just from the city. And then he, it went, it went like kind of weird 
where he was like, what are you, one of those rich city folks that you can be out here for months? And I was like, okay, that's my cue, gotta go. So that was the only time, but it was, it was harmless. I think I got more paranoid than anything. Cause then once I got off, when I got on the trail, I kept seeing where they were. And I was like, are they going to meet me at the trailhead? You know, I got a little crazy, but that was the only time, but it was, it was harmless. No one was ever, people were saying some crazy stuff like, um, uh, you know, you're the only, you're like the second black person I've seen on a trail or stuff like that. Nothing too, they were just really excited to see me and I was just excited for them. So nothing too negative. Um, what did you miss that you didn't have when you were on your trip? What did you miss not having on your trip? I think that's what it means. Like, what did you miss most while you were on your so, hey, hmm. showers? <laughs> um, I just didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I I walked into this. I was in a great, I was in a great situation, a, a great position in my life where I didn't have a lot of responsibilities, and at the time. I had just came back from Italy. I was living in Italy for like a year. So when I came back to New York, I was working on a project with my friend and I didn't have to go back there. And I had nowhere to, I had, I, before I went to Italy, I had sold everything I owned and put the rest in storage. So I didn't have crazy responsibilities. I didn't have, um, you know, a job, I had money saved. So there was, I, I walked into this knowing that I'm doing this adventure and I'm putting that aside, I'm living this adventure. So it wasn't a lot that I missed on the trail, except for that, that shower that I mentioned. Um, did you have to go off the trail every couple of days to buy food, or how did you replenish yeah. your food? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I lived off the trees and in the, in the, in the, in the leaves. <laughs> <laughs> I ate raccoons and squirrels. No, um, we would resupply. So I would carry whatever I thought the amount I needed to get me to the next uh, – a uh, small town. Sometimes a trail would go through towns like Hot Springs. Uh, I would resupply wherever there was a town. So sometimes it was five miles away. We would hitch a ride, which was another adventure where I would need my white hiking friends with me because I'm in the deep south and I ain't gonna pick this dude up. <laughs> so um, yeah, I would have to either hike into town uh, and resupply. A lot of times, uh, these small towns they're hiker friendly and they know exactly what we need. We need a cheap place to buy food. So they would take us straight to Walmart if they had one. And I would buy my Snickers, buy my ramen, buy my you know rice sides, my oatmeal, my Pop-Tart, all that I needed. So yes, I would have to go off trail, just carry enough uh, to take me to the next town. And I had, Nina sent me some stuff ha at the halfway point. So she sent me like a care package of stuff. That's awesome. Um, so you talked to, you kind of self-identify as an unlikely hiker. Um, so someone maybe people would be surprised to see on the trails. Did you ever run into anyone on the trail that you were surprised to see there? And um, so, what did I, you didn't, I didn't actually, in the beginning, like, I, I I have to say that other people identify me as an unlikely through hiker. So, and I do share the story that who I was, and then I see that. So I don't want people to think like, oh, I walked in, and I was like, oh, no. It was something that gradually, like, people were telling me that I was. Mm -hmm. As far as seeing other people on the trail uh, that I was surprised to see, well, because I, in my head, I wasn't, I didn't think that way. I was like, oh, everyone does this. So, no, I, I didn't get surprised by anyone that I didn't think. Like, I've seen old people, you know, there was people in their 70s out there on the trail, and it was, like, just normal. It's just something you do, so. Um, one more question here. What was your water filtration system? I had the, um, it was a water pump. It's a, I keep calling it Katahdin, but it's not Katahdin. Um, it was a water pump that I would connect. I just had a hose that I dropped in the water stream or whatever the water source was, and I would pump it. And then the other, it would pop, it would, uh, the other hose on the top would go into uh, the, uh, whatever I had, the container or the bladder or, or whatever it was. And my problem was in the beginning that I carried too much water. I had like a three liter bladder and then I had two, uh, two liters of water, which I didn't need because in the beginning, there's a lot of streams along the, the trail. So I really needed like the two bottles and just, kind of like pump like fresh water. And it's that water that came out was filtered. It would get rid of the debris and anything else that was in it. So that was the best thing. Uh, to this day, I still use it. Um, okay, I think we've got one last question. Um, you were talking about kind of the different trail angels and the trail magic, the things that people kind of um, 
do to support the hikers on the trail. And I'm wondering if you have a favorite piece of trail magic that you got when you were on your hike. My thing is that in the beginning, uh, trail magic, I felt weird about it because I'm from Brooklyn. So if you see someone leaving food somewhere, you just step right over. I'm like, I ain't touching that, you know. So it took me a while to get used to it. And it, I talk about it in one chapter called A Suspicious Mind, where I'm from Brooklyn. And if someone's giving you stuff, they want something from you. You know, I'm like, you talking to me, trying to give me that? Where's my wallet? You know, I'm looking around. from. They want something from me. So it took me a while to get used to that. Uh, once I did, I would only take what I needed. So my, my mindset was trail magic is only for, uh, we're not, we don't, people don't give you trail magic because you deserve it. It's something that, that you need. So I would only take if I needed water, like in New York, New Jersey, New York at that season, that season I did it, it there was a drought and it was super hot and people would leave gallons of water. So that was kind of my favorite trail magic was something that I really needed. Uh, so I would say that, and also I got heat sickness at one point in New York, New York State, because it was so hot, and I thought I was drinking enough water, but I wasn't. And Shanti and I got a ride into uh, into a small town called Tuxedo, and stayed at someone's home, and it let me stay. And like I was, so I was dehydrated, so they were giving me crazy amount of Gatorade. I couldn't even eat, and it had a, a like a couch on there in their office, and I I stayed there the night. That was one of the best trail magic because I really needed. It. I was sick. And the next day they drove me to New York City because I spent the weekend to like kind of resupply New York City and also have like a hiker bash to reconnect with people since we were on the trail for so long, we reconnect with them in New York City and then go back on the trail. Well, thank you so much for um, tuning in and sharing your story and sharing so many insights about your adventure. It's really um, so exciting to hear and thank you so much. You're welcome. This was fun. Thank you. Hey, wasn't that just great? If you love Derek's presentation, show your love, type a couple things in chat and order the book. The good news, Derek, is someone was trying to order the book. The bad news is it looks like the code was uh, expired. So you probably oh, have to worry, back no worries. As soon as I get off here, I'm going to fix that for you guys. So that, yeah. use that code and I promise you that you'll be able to use it. Now, we could keep Derek on all night, but uh, for those who are on, we'll know the concept of Hiker Midnight. Uh, Derek's on the East Coast, and it's about a half hour past Hiker Midnight where he is. So yeah. we're going to let him go. We want to thank again once our co-sponsors. We want to thank Derek, of course. And we want to thank Haley for her excellent moderation of the Q&A. And all of the co-sponsors, including the Friends of Scotch and Peaks Wilderness, the Lands Council, uh, Washington Trails Association, Idaho Trails Association, and of course, the Idaho Conservation League's LA program. And thank you all for participating. We hope to be offering more of these throughout the winter, uh, more opportunities to connect with those people who want to connect with the great outdoors. Thank you, everyone, for showing up tonight. <laughs>